um, thanks, thanks for everyone for sharing your your lunch time with us. Um, the seminar the seminar is being recorded, just for you to note. Uh, the title of today's seminar is Where Should the Metals for the Green Transition Come From? Um, it's a study that is that uses life cycle sustainability analysis framework and standard life cycle analysis to compare the environmental, social, and economic impacts of two potential sources of minerals. We have two excellent speakers that will be bringing up presentation for today. Um, Diana Polikas and Dr. Stephen Katona. I will introduce the second speaker first and then the first speaker last. So our second speaker for today is Dr. Stephen Katona. He is a, a president emeritus of the College of the Atlantic. He's also a co-founder and managing director of Conservation International Ocean Health Index. And we have uh, Diana Polikas. She's an independent researcher a multidisciplinary consultant has worked with Boston Consulting Group. She has also consulted independently for the World Bank and city government. Um, now we have two excellent speakers who will be talking today about where should metals for the green transition come from. Um, I think maybe the best way is to let them speak for about 30, 40 minutes and then we take the questions afterwards. If you have any questions, you know, while they are speaking, you can just type it in the chat and we can read it. I can read it out for the speakers after the presentation, or if you can wait until they finish talking, if you raise hands, I can just call your name to ask your question. And in the event that we're not able to take all the questions that will be asked today, I'll type them and send them to the speakers and they'll be able to provide answers and we can distribute to everyone. Um, who attended the webinar or, or to the whole of the departments. I just wanted to quickly announce that um, we'll post a link to the new peer-reviewed research paper that is based on this work in the chat. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more, please um, just click on that link. So without further ado, uh, Diana, uh, please, um, thanks. Yeah, please, you can take the stage now. Great, thanks. And you can see the slides. Is that is that right? I can see the slides. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, so thanks. So good to see you again. Thanks for the intro. Um, and hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Uh, so Stephen is uh, an expert in marine biology and ecology, and I bring a heterogeneous background, including systems and business and modeling. And over a year ago, together, we took on this massive project. We're excited to share the results today. Um, it's hard to go over 170 page white paper in 40 minutes, but we'll do uh, as much as we can as quickly as possible and still leave some time for questions. Um, and uh, so we had a few, uh, we had actually three more co-authors from Deep Green Metals on their on the team sharing expertise. Uh, a lot of the work that they had done or um, put together had, was helpful in giving us some of the baseline data and also um, some uh, more info. And also we uh, leveraged numerous experts from industry and academia throughout the process just uh, to help with assumptions and various reviews, the LCA process, uh, onshore and offshore metallurgy, lots of different topics that we were engaging experts on. And we will also mention some of this throughout. Um, and so I'll just start with a bit of a framing and then I'll go into an uh, outline for what we'll talk about. So our team wrote this paper that takes on the question, where should society get these four metals, which will be needed in massive quantities for the coming green transition? Um, and so I'll start with the framing of this question, why we're taking it on to begin with, and then I'll come back to this. So the first question I just want to pose is like, what's the problem with metal mining today? Many of you may be aware with several of these aspects, but there's sort of four parts to this puzzle. So first, there is a lot of metal demand coming as part of the global green transition to renewable, renewables. And secondly, that's juxtaposed against the climate crisis, so with an urgent need to minimize carbon emissions as much as possible. But mining, third of all, mining comes with substantial impacts, including climate change impact, but other impacts like habitat damage, waste, toxicity, pollution, tailings, dam collapses, threats to biodiversity, and many, many others. So if you have this exponential demand growth juxtaposed against something that's already having harmful impacts, Sounds like a bit of a problem. And then third, uh, fourth, uh, several of these supply um, supply chains for some of the metals, particularly cobalt and nickel, pose risks um, for cobalt. 
very low ore, ore grades, as well as a substantial amount of unsafe artisanal mining and child labor, geopolitical issues with supply chain concentration. For nickel, there's a mismatch of the resource types ideally needed for battery grade nickel sulfate. There's also declining ore grades, which have been created for decades, and which also worsen the impacts. Um, and so looking at that first point for the, the green transition metal demand, I just want to uh, step into that for a second because that frames some of, of how we framed our conclusions for the study. And specifically, we will talk about electric vehicles. So for instance, um, we see this Morgan Stanley 2017 projection, which shows us hitting a billion passenger EVs globally around 2047. The blue curve you see there on the top is normal internal combustion engine vehicles. That green curve on the bottom is the uh, fully battery electric vehicles. And um, later in the talk, we'll show that we picked this as a tangible demand scenario for framing our assumptions. And now the thing is that EVs require a lot of metal to build the batteries. Uh, the reason the big incre increase in this coming metal demand is a problem is because the batteries themselves contribute highly to the life cycle emissions of an EV. And so this bar chart shows life cycle emissions for regular cars on the left. Uh, you have an internal combustion vehicle, the average European car. This, uh, I think the data is from 2018 or so. Um, and on the right, you see the first example, a Tesla Model 3. Uh, you see its bars are broken down by battery manufacturer in teal, then fuel cycle, so the recharging of the battery, and then the manufacture of the actual vehicle. If you see the bar on the right, which is Norway, where they have um, they don't have any contribution from the recharge because of their clean, uh, their clean grid, Still, a majority of that bar comes from the manufacturing battery itself, and a more majority of that is just the metals and materials making up the battery. So this just shows you that even if you transition fully to EVs from ICEs, you still have to deal with the contribution to the emissions that are coming from the materials of the metals. And so if you're making metals for a billion EVs, that obviously can have a huge emissions implication. So the transition to this clean future has this associated negative impact, and that's what we're looking at. And now if you just look at one uh, EV battery, how much metal is that exactly? So and some of you may have watched Tesla's battery day yesterday, and we learned about some of their plans to um, try to go to zero cobalt. So we can obviously talk about that on the side. Our assumption as of writing the study was that NMC811, which is a um, which is a Tesla Model 3 battery, and this was a scenario that we used to see how much metal might be needed to make a billion EV batteries. And the amount that's shown here multiplied is 155 kilograms just for one battery, including the copper for the wiring and harness. Um, and if we scale that to a billion, then you have 155 million tons of these, just these four metals, not even including lithium, not even including anything outside of EVs, just for EVs um, by the year 2047 or so. And then if you also include other things that are part of the green transition, now you have hundreds of megatons of these metals that are going to be needed. So if we come back to this question, that's to motivate why are we asking this question and why do we care about the impacts of these metals? Now let's come back to the question and think about what the options are. Because in order to supply that much metal, which is a net new demand, we'll have to ramp up metal production that isn't currently in the pipelines. You saw Elon talking about calling all the CEOs of these nickel producing companies to try and get them to make more nickel because it's not currently in the plan. So you have land options and you have ocean options and you would either consider primary extraction or recycling broadly. So on the land side, there's not nearly enough metal stock to supply this new demand with recycling. And that was just revalidated by a recent World Bank report. Um, because you have exponential growth in demand for a product with a 10 year or so use cycle. So you have a widening supply gap over time with which recycling cannot fill. And landfills are furthermore expensive and difficult to scale their mining of metals from that. So we either ramp up land mining, a clear option, to meet the new demand, or we meet it with a different source from the ocean. So from the other ocean options, we in this study and um, most people in this discussion are primarily focusing on polymetallic nodules. In the study, we only look at polymetallic nodules, partly because they're less, evasive, less invasive to mine. They're also the subject of imminent exploitation regulations by the International Seabed Authority. So there's been a lot of questions about, you know, how, how do the impacts compare versus ocean and land? And we wanted to have some quantitative data that we can actually look at to compare the two. 
so that drives the study that we have done here. Um, and since, you know, deep sea mining or DSM is a bit of a hot topic because it's, it's really impossible to cause absolutely no disruption to the ocean when we're taking metals from it, of course. Um, currently, any dis discussion, though, of DSM impacts, it's often hyper-focused on just the ocean impacts and biodiversity harm. But they're not taking a step back and looking across all impacts, and they're also not looking often um, at the whole life cycle, or at least the cradle to gate life cycle of producing the metal, which means um, not just the ocean impacts, but the land impacts of processing, the waste that's produced. And they're not comparing across that whole cycle between the ocean and the land. So a more appropriate scientific analysis would be life cycle focused, it would include onshore processing impacts, quantified as much as possible, um, and we would contextualize by comparing apples to apples against a very specific demand scenario, which is what we've done here. And so I'll get into the guts very soon, but last point is just the, the key themes I would say from this webinar. At a high level, we hope you would take away some of these four points. First, just overall the drivers of har harmful impacts of metal production in general, just an understanding of what, where those come from. And there's a lot more about this in the paper that I can get to in this short discussion. Uh, second, how nodule impacts compare to land or mining, big picture. Third, biodiversity. We do a bit of a deep dive there because it's such a hot topic. Um, and fourth, uh, what are some of the impacts beyond the environmental that matter for this decision? So here's the outline. We've just done the injection, and I will now quickly dive into the methods we used, uh, give you a quick overview of the impact drivers, and then we have five impact categories. I'll touch on two of them, which are the climate change and economic, and then I will hand it over to Steve. So you'll see the sort of side-by-side -side comparison as a template we use uh, to present a lot of the results here. Um, so we focus on this, the study on this impact comparison between virgin land ores and nodules defined by that specific demand scenario of making 1 billion EVs of that specific chemistry, just so we have an apples to apples um, comparison. Uh, and I, I think one more other point there is that we assessed average impacts and scaled them up to 1 billion DVs, but you'll see that on land ores, because of ore grade dynamics and ore grades getting less and less, we've added some dynamics into the results that you could see what the expected actual um, impacts would be by 2047. And many of you are familiar with LCA, I think. So we used a cradle to gate LCA as the underlying basis for much of this analysis. As you know, it's an ISO standard framework for environmental impact uh, comparison and trade off assessment includes direct and indirect impacts from material and energy flows in making a product or a material. Um, and cradle to gate let us compare impacts to produce the same marginal kilogram of metal in the same form from two different pathways or sources, which is exactly applicable to the question that we have at hand here. And this is just a quick visual of how we came up with the taxonomy we used. We really focused this on what is relevant and practical practical information that people wanted or need to know in making these decisions. So we married a top down and bottom up approach focused on all three sustainable pillars and uh, all three sustainability pillars. And we identified a comprehensive set of quantitative and qualitative analyses and indicators um, with very, some very specific impact metrics and others in more qualitative discussion. Again, you know, this is a big undertaking. So we focused on going deep where we could and where it was more relevant um, and being as comprehensive as possible. And you can uh, see the summary of the indicators here. There's a lot more in the paper. And this is just a brief visual to show how we constructed the LCA models, which drove many of the metrics. We started with the cradle sources on the left, uh, land or ocean ores, and then identical gate products on the right. These are the four formats that, as of today, are the the forms required for impact into processing plants that are making batteries. So you have sulfates, nickel sulfate, cobalt, manganese sulfate, and then copper cathode. And then in the middle, you see the three common stages of metal production, um, the mining or extraction process, and the processing, and then the refining. For land ores, we use literature review to identify the studies that were most relevant in representing the impacts for um, and the production pathways relevant to battery production for each of the battery metals. 
and we have a lot of details um, on the selection process. Uh, and then we made adjustments as needed so that if, for example, a paper gives you impacts for nickel, and for now, this process will be to take nickel to nickel sulfate, then we added the nickel sulfate on top of that, the materials on top of that. For nodules, since there's not yet a commercial production system, this is where we created a new uh, LCA model based on deep green metals proposed system. We used, again, standard ISO processes, the EcoInvent database, uh, Sigma Pro uh, to enter the model and, and run the indicators. Um, a number of inputs included detailed metallurgy flow sheets and independently compiled Canadian standard compliant preliminary economic assessment based on their design and a robust set of detailed plans and data. Um, from this, we got the material and energy flow input data we needed for the LCA. And then all of these details and background material results can be found here. This is a, just a quick overview of what you can find if you, if you want more details on any of these organized as you can see here. So now I just want to say a couple words on what drives the impacts of metal production because this helps give an understanding and grounding for interpreting the results we end up getting. And I grouped into three basic different categories or difference categories between landowners and nodules, the geographies that or themselves their or, or characteristics, and then the methods or processes to, to process the orders. So first, the geographies disturbed by land mining are very different from nodule geographies. You can see here, this is just the number one producing countries for each of the four metals. Um, they're found in very geographically diverse areas. Some of them are mega diverse. Um, and if they are high in biodiversity, then the land mining requires clearing forests, disturbing animal habitats, often causing pollution, harming communities. Uh, these, are, these are impacts that we all either know about and, and are used to, or just kind of don't think about, but they're there and they're in large numbers. Um, and you can see, you can take a closer look at some of these land ecosystem where the mining occurs that can be very rich in life, like Indonesian rainforests and Alaskan wilds. Nodules and other resources are located obviously in the ocean, so obviously away from human communities with lower density of creatures. And here in this map, you can see in blue the nodule areas, in yellow the sea mound areas, which with the thick sulfide crusts, and then in red lines are the hydrothermal vents, which also have lots of metals. So the part that we're focused on is the clarion Clipperton zone. You can see there uh, around Hawaii or so, circled in the middle. That zone has enough metals to electrify the global passenger fleet several times, in fact. Um, that entire zone is about 1.5% of the world's abyssal plain area, and about 2.5% of the water column above the CCZ, 2.5% uh, of the volume of the Pacific Ocean or so. And not all of it is, is targeted to be mined. You see here a lot of um, APEIs, protection areas that are set aside, um, blocks that are not to be touched, and then in the colored zones are where the contractors currently have proposed uh, areas to, exp uh, to explore. And what does that environment look like? It's very stark. The seafloor itself is four to, si four to six kilometers deep there, roughly. It has intense pressures, lack of light reaching it, so the nodule areas are food poor, few creatures live there, um, relatively to what you might be used to on land. And the ones that do there do live there tend to be a very small scale, as uh, Stephen will talk a little bit more about that later. So the first difference is just those geographies are very different where the ores are found. The second has to do with the actual ore being mined. So on land, the grades for nickel, copper, and cobalt are, fa are fairly low. And as I mentioned, nickel and uh, copper have been decreasing exponentially for a very long time. And that matters because if, if the ore, the ore grade splits in half, then twice as much ore has to be dug up and processed, which means more impacts, more waste, more materials, more energy processing. So it, it, it impacts all of the impacts for many of them. Um, and then also you have several massive waste streams generated both by the mining process itself and, and during the processing as well. You have tailings, dams, which is waste that needs to be dammed up and managed indefinitely. Frequently, they are mismanaged. They can become toxic. Dams have failed. Communities are often harmed. Um, and this is a consequence of um, land mining, in part because you have the low ore grades to deal with. Sorry. The difference in the ore in the polymetallic nodules is you have four, um, all four metals in one ore of fairly high grades. Um, 
in, in, so there's two notable ways that the nodule ores can contribute to waste reduction, which you'll see later. A, the grade is higher overall and constant, and copper and cobalt have over twice the average ore compared to the land ores. But B, secondly, there's also no significant amounts of toxic elements in those nodule ores, whereas land ores have a lot of toxic element levels. And that is actually an enabling factor for producing a zero waste processing design from nodules, which is not possible with land ores because of that fundamental difference. So the third difference is in how land ores and nodules are processed or can be processed. I just have one quick diagram for this, which shows the three basic phases again of mining, uh, mining, processing, and then refining with land ores on the top and nodules in the bottom. And the red boxes that you see here are just innate negative impact contributors. So processing landers has some inherent handicaps, which uh, depending on the pathway can include the necessity of reduction, concentration, beneficiation processes, truck use, low ore grades, uh, fossil based electricity grids, and these things all contribute to impact. Um, processing nodules have a few inherent inv advantages shown in blue. The um, really interesting one is the ship transport. So the fact that nodules have to be taken by ship to their processing plant means that you, um, first of all, ship transport per 10 kilometers lo lower impact, but secondly, you have a, gives you flexibility of optimizing your plant location for environmental factors that on the land or side, you basically are tied to being close to where the mine is, at least to get the, to put the concentration plant. And then the third is nodules actually have some potential advantages. Here they're integrated in this green color um, based on operator choice to exploit these advantages. Um, for example, hydropower use, because you can put the plant anywhere accessible by ship means you can put it somewhere um, that, that leverages hydropower or other renewable powers that have a low footprint. Uh, you can also put a plant near end markets so that potential wastes can instead be economically reused, not become wastes. And it also includes a flexibility to design a flow sheet that eliminates wastes and residues. So for more on the impact drivers, I will refer you back to the paper. And I hope we're okay on time. Um, great, so now I will go through two quick results sections. First, the climate change. And this is um, all the all the numbers you'll see here are, are now found in the paper that was just, I think, published a couple of days ago. It was finally released. So you can also get even more detail on the climate change impacts in that paper. So this analysis consisted of two parts. We'll start with climate change emissions or the global warming potential GWP indicator. Um, and we figured out per kilogram impacts for both land ores and nodules, and then extrapolated them to 1 billion EVs. And as I mentioned before, for land ores, we also included some future dynamics cases. So we basically had an, uh, a baseline case that incorporated ore grade decline, and then an optimistic green case, which supposed that fossil electricity would be phased out of the background electricity grids by 2050. And here's that result. For the optimistic green case, we saw to make the four metals for 1 billion EVs, it would, excuse me, roughly one and a half gigatons of carbon dioxide would be emitted if land ores were used to make those 100, 1 billion EV batteries. And compare this to the global emissions, which about uh, 37 billion um, gigatons emitted annually, or a billion tons emitted annually, and a remaining IPCC budget is around 235 for a 66% chance of staying within the 1.5 degrees. So this is non-trivial contributor, I would say. Um, and when we compare this to the nodules, we see more than two-thirds reduction if we use the nodules. And if you want to see how that breaks apart, on the left, we have the individual metal results uh, with per kilogram reduction varying from 22% to 80%, the most reduction seen for nickel. Um, and on the right side, we see the breakout for the aggregate impact for the billion EVs by metal. Uh, you see both the land scenarios there, so you can compare how in the baseline land versus the green land, how incorporating a um, the fossil fuel electricity phase out contributes. It does bring it down a bit, but you still have a substantial uh, larger impact compared to the baseline scenario for nodules of just 0.44. And of these, you see that nickel sulfate and copper cather are contributing the most to the GDP, in part due to the greater quantities per EV and also nickel's high overall GWP. So the second topic uh, of the climate change analysis was carbon sequestration. And here on land, on land sequestered carbon is found in vegetation and soils. So we quantified the amount of stored carbon at risk of release 
using the LCIA land competition as a proxy for area and global average carbon content in forests and known forests. Or for the C, there's been speculation that DSM could impact sequestration. So there we looked into the different possible mechanisms of impact. Um, sequestered carbon is found in seabed sediments and in seawater as dissolved inorganic carbon. So nodule collection stirs up the sediments and some theorize that potentially some of that carbon could rise to the surface. So we looked at that. Also, some of the seawater is brought to the surface when the nodules are collected and and brought up some tubes, there are gonna be some water in there. So some theoretically, when the water is at the top and the nodules are being collected out onto the ship, some water might have exposure to air and some dissolved inorganic carbon might escape. So we looked at that. And then of course, nodule processing has a land footprint because it has onshore processing and the indirect impacts from building, you know, getting the metals to build the ship that's doing the collection that has land footprint. So we also looked at that. Um, so not, and then not only did we calculate the amount of carbon at risk of escape, but then we also looked at potential future disruption to carbon services. And we considered a scenario of 100 years cessation for both land and sea. And here's the results for land ores. So for the first thing we looked at, how much sequestered, already sequestered carbon at risk of release is nine giga, over nine gigatons to make one billion EVs using land ores if, if care is not taken to prevent its release. Additionally, 2 billion tons of CO2 may not be sequestered because of disrupt, uh, disturbed, unreclaimed land. Here to nodules, we see that despite some concerns, it looks like far less sequestered carbon is at risk with nodules. And of that 0.58, most of it is due to that physical uh, onshore processing and indirect impacts. Similarly, similar, 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 um, for, for the... Um, for the 100 years of potentially not sequestered carbon. The majority of the impact is coming from the land. Hi, Diana. Um, Hi, sorry to interrupt. We have about 10 to 15 minutes um, left for the presentation. OK, OK. Bye. I will run through economic very quickly. Uh, and, uh, I will just mention that we have also looked at some economic impacts and that the nodules, um, cost-wise, sit very low on the cost curves. And if we want to look at country specific impacts, you can look at how where different producers are sitting on these cost curves for the different metals. Um, and all of this is discussed in the paper. Um, we also show some projections for how the markets will uh, would grow for EV demand purposes and versus what the capacities look like they will be and therefore have some impact discussion. All right. I will now turn it over to Stephen. Thanks, Dinah. Uh, yes. Uh, I've requested control and. Um, there you go. All right. There. Um, hi, everybody. And thank you for uh, attending today. Uh, we're going to talk now about non living resource impacts, um, comparing nodules versus land ores. And um, we're going to look at these categories, uh, wastes, land use, forests, cleared water, toxicity, and so forth. And um, the, the basic um, advantage that nodules have over land ores is that all the ores are in one uh, little package, whereas on land, um, they are covered over by rock and soil, and they're usually, not always, <clears throat> but usually all in different mines. So a lot of waste is um, uh, is produced. And remember, in this scenario, we're looking at pr producing uh, materials for a billion batteries, and that's over a period of about 30 years. So the total waste um, generated on land by producing uh, the four metals is 64 billion tons, and that's over 30 years. Um, the uh, just for comparison, uh, two gig, gig, gigatons per year is what the world produces in general solid waste each year. Uh, that's uh, 216 data. So a lot of waste. And the reason is, as we mentioned, that uh, uh, all of the ores are in pretty high concentration in one little package. So um, 
you really have uh, much less rock and other stuff um, to uh, produce as waste. Uh, mining on land uses uh, quite a bit of area, a total of about 156,000 kilometers squared, about the size of Tunisia, um, to produce the billion batteries. And um, of that, uh, some of it is forested, we'll get to that, and uh, some of it is, uh, is not. If you look at the total amount of uh, land used to make uh, the ores on land and seabed used to to uh, produce the nodules. You see that the you use about 508,000 square kilometers um, to produce the nodules to collect them, and you use about uh, a little less than 10,000 square kilometers of land for the processing plant for nodules, which has to be on land. For the land ores, 155,000 square kilometers of uh, land is used, much of it high biodiversity, as Dinah has mentioned, and also about 2,000 square kilometers of ocean because um, in uh, several locations, um, tailings are injected into the, uh, into the ocean. So, of the 156,000 square kilometers, about 66,000 square kilometers are uh, forests. This is about the same area as Sri Lanka. And that uh, deforestation is responsible for the loss of sequestered carbon, as Dinah mentioned, but it also has large implications for uh, ecosystem services and for biodiversity. Mining has uh, traditionally uh, used quite a lot of water uh, on land um, to produce the billion batteries. About 45 billion tons of water will be used over the 30 years. And this is about 11 years worth of current global water consumption. Um, and the amount of water we're talking about would cover Jamaica to a depth of about four meters. So it's a substantial water use, especially as uh, climate effects increase drought and the increasing human population is drawing down all water resources. Um, there's a lot of uh, toxicity as well as some eutrophication produced from the waste products of terrestrial mining. Uh, these things are all expressed in the LCA a model as uh, equivalents. The toxicity is equivalent to, um, is compared to uh, an amount of mothballs, one for dichlorobenzene, and it's about 33 megatons of uh, toxicity to land and about 21 gigatons of toxicity um, to the fresh water resources as a result of uh, drainage, acid, mine waste, and all of that. So it's a very environmentally uh, challenging process. And some um, phosphate equivalent is also discharged that can um, uh, produce uh, eutrophication, about 80 million tons equivalent um, overall. So if we compare um, the two uh, sources, we see that on the left, the terrestrial sources, uh, the numbers are always very much higher than for the nodules on the right, with the exception of the amount of seabed used, which is extensive uh, for sure. But in general, um, the uh, non-living resource uh, advantages go to nodules as far as our analysis uh, could show. Biodiversity is a, a much more difficult topic because it's ha much harder to quantify than the, um, the uh, non-living resources. Uh, for one reason, the um, species um, in the deep sea are not well known, nor are the species in the overlying water column. Neither the species nor uh, their abundance are uh, well known. 
But what's even more interesting is that the types of animals, and here we're only talking about animals, plants are completely devalued in this um, comparison because they don't exist on the deep sea floor or for that matter in the overlying uh, water column in any uh, part that's going to be affected. Um, the animals uh, down below are almost all invertebrates. There are some fishes. Uh, they're um, fairly simple um, compared to the animals impacted on land, um, some of which you see here. And the, the question that um, we have to answer really in the end is uh, some species in and um, systems are going to get hurt, which ones are we going to allow that to happen to? Are we going to um, impact for the first time a fairly pristine uh, deep sea environment, or are we going to add further um, impacts to an already uh, stressed terrestrial uh, landscape? These are the bio mega biodiversity ranks of uh, the top uh, of countries in mining. And as you can see, the top 17 countries in the world in terms of mega diversity um, are all involved in mining metals and many of them involved in mining the four metals we're talking about. Some of the wildlife that is at risk uh, are some of our primate ancestors, tarsier shown here in Philippines, um, it's challenged, but this one lives on an island that's 60 uh, kilometers long. There are 10 uh, nickel extractors uh, working on that island, and this uh, is a challenged species. Here in the southeast of the United States, jaguars are challenged by a proposed copper mining uh, plant that will reduce water sources available to wildlife, including this species. Uh, in the Philippines, another endangered bird, um, less than 500 um, uh, individuals remaining. So um, because we couldn't identify <clears throat> all of the species that will be impacted, we had to try something else. Uh, we did were able to estimate the number of individual animals of um, and here we're not talking about uh, bacteria or um, anything like that, but we are talking about uh, earthworm-sized animals and bigger. And um, the number uh, on land is about 47 trillion megafauna, and um, the biomass impacted would be, as best we could estimate, about uh, 568 megatons. So numbers and biomass really doesn't address the biodiversity in the way that it is typically defined. And we're currently working on a paper that does this a little um, more in depth. But the kinds of wildlife at risk on the bottom, as I said, are all small um, or mainly small, uh, mainly invertebrate. They look like this. Um, the megafauna are defined as being larger than two centimeters, whereas on land, megafauna is defined as being uh, greater than about 40 uh, kilograms. And then there are the little things living in between the sediment grains here you see compared to the size of an American penny. And there are lots of them. There are fish. These were uh, attracted to baited traps, and some of them are big but their um, actual population abundance is not known uh, yet. And when we uh, compare, as I showed you, the megafauna organisms at risk on land, 47 trillion, compared to about 3 trillion uh, on the bottom. And remember, we are not able yet to um, evaluate the water column because um, neither the species are fully known nor their numbers. And the biomass at risk, um, again, uh, comparing terrestrial to uh, seafloor, is uh, much lower on the seafloor. Um, I'm not going to spend 
um, too much time on this. This is the uh, density per square meter of the different um, size classes of life. And um, the what you can see here is that um, the numbers are higher on land um, for um, organism density per square meter. And when you look at the organisms at risk uh, for terrestrial mining over the 156,000 square kilometers and the uh, deep sea mining uh, for the 508,000 square kilometers, you see that um, the number of smaller organisms um, that is higher on land in one case and uh, the prokaryotes, uh, bacteria, are higher uh, in the ocean. But the, for the larger size classes of animals, the megafauna, it's much higher on, uh, on land. So um, basically, since we're time limited, I'll just skip to um, ecosystem services. And because this area is so remote from um, human settlements, um, more than 500 miles in any direction. Uh, and it's, of course, an area beyond national jurisdiction, I should, we should have mentioned earlier. Um, the ecosystem services provided are very low, so that those at risk, shown in red, are much fewer in habitat loss and species extinction risk, whereas many more ecosystem services on land. So, um, the social impacts, I think uh, we're going to just skip through very quickly. Um, suffice it that mining is one of the most dangerous um, occupations on the planet. And just the deaths to miners for the billion uh, battery metals uh, produced would be about 1,800 over 30 years. And that doesn't count um, lives lost in surrounding communities or anything like that. Um, Dinah mentioned um, tailings, spills, devastating child labor uh, in the production of, uh, of um, cobalt, pretty devastating to kids and families. Uh, impacts on indigenous species, I'm sorry, on indigenous peoples are fairly common um, throughout the uh, terrestrial world, uh, mining impacts um, tribes and uh, traditional herders and others, and none of that occurs in the uh, deep sea. So um, there are considerable um, benefits to people if uh, the material is taken from the uh, from the bottom. So if you look at the overall footprint of mining on for these metals on land, the uh, footprint is much bigger than for nodules. And uh, the biodiversity is the place where um, we're most concerned and uh, we have further work in progress. So um, in all cases, um, in our analysis, and we're not connected by the way to a deep green or to any mining people. We are consultants and um, not told what to say or do. Uh, and this is our analysis. And it shows um, that in uh, all cases, the uh, production of the uh, metals from nodule sources uh, reduce impacts substantially. And um, so that's where we are at the present and the International Seabed Authority uh, will, in the coming uh, months and years, have to make the decision about whether to permit exploitation of that resource. Um, and that's the decision that um, society is going to have to um, confront as um, you know time goes by and the time for that decision is approaching. So thank you very much. And we look forward to your journey.
Thank you, Dana and Dina and Stephen for an excellent presentation. Um, I've got a number of questions, so I'll just read them out. If there's any questions we're not able to take today, I'll I'll send them to the speakers, and when they answer them, I'll just send it to to the group. Uh, the first question is: um, Did you include end of life impacts? What do you prefer, Diane and Stephen? Do you want me to? Do you want to answer after every question, or do you want me to read two questions and you answer them? What's your preference? Maybe give us, give us two or three at a time, and then we'll address them. Okay. Good. So the first one is: um, Do you include end of life impacts? Um, I think the second one could be related to the first one. So the second one I read: um, The mismanagement of mining on land can be replicated in the nodal mining. Um, especially in areas where there are non student rules regarding ocean resources. Um, can you shed more light on this? Um, I can take the, the, for the first one. So in the model, we just stopped at, um, at a refined kilogram of metal and we only um, we didn't process. Uh, we didn't have any waste in the nodules. Um, model because of, of um, a description that we gave previously. So uh, what is done with the metal and um, so I'd say this, the summary is we didn't have any end of life impacts that we assessed and we start we stopped only at the refined metal um, to compare that to the landowner's literature. So in short, the answer is no, yeah. because um, we just did cradle to gate and not um, you know, a lifetime assessment. So, um, and that's where the way this is typically done. With regard to the second question, yes, it's possible to screw it up for sure. Um, the, um, remember this is an area beyond national jurisdiction. And so it's uh, completely controlled by the International Seabed Authority, which is a UN uh, affiliate that um, was set up by the um, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Mm -hmm. um, so they are put, they've put together quite extensive requirements for environmental impact statements and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what happens is that um, uh, crawlers, um, tractor-like things will be on the floor of the ocean and they will um, use hydraulic uh, uh, jets to blow um, nodules, which are just free on the surface uh, for the most part, to blow them into a hopper and se separate most of the sediment. And then the nodules go up a pipe, uh, which is uh, uh, powered by an airlift and that then they go into a uh, production uh, vessel uh, ship at the surface and then the nodules are strained out and the water is pumped back down to a depth uh, which is being determined by scientists and engineers where it'll do the least damage but um the top probably the top five centimeters at most 10 centimeters are going to be disturbed and most of that sediment um, uh, falls to the bottom um, and the stuff that gets pumped up, the entrained sediments, which might be uh, about 5% of sediments, uh, gets pumped up and then pumped down with the discharge water. So um, it's a fairly simple procedure and um, there are about, uh, I think at least 19 contractors um, we can't be certain that they're all going to do the same thing um, or w that they will all be as careful as some of the companies. So um, this is something that will have to be watched mm -hmm. and um, how enforcement will be done mm -hmm. is not clear. It's, it's, you know, the ISA does not have a Navy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So um, one is going to have to be very careful about this whole process, but um, it, it can be done with, um, you know, even, let me put it this way, even if it's done at its best, it still does involve harm to, to the, bottom, the bottom, some to the water. 
Could I just add very quickly to that? Very quickly. Um, sure. So yes, all of the 19 contractors have these hefty required scientific studies that they have to be undergoing right now uh, for Deep Green. I think it's a two year process. And then the ISA has put forward gates of what um, what these studies must show. They are in the process of forming the regulations, kind of like a, a large system design study that the government might might produce. And what those specific criteria are, are under debate and are under discussion by, um, by marine ecologists about what should be, what is serious harm, what isn't, and what should those standards be. However, it's very unique in that there is a single body that is co collecting data and setting standards as opposed to land or mining where every individual country has their purview of what standards to set. Often there, there may be corruption involved, there may be non-compliance to varying degrees. So there's a plus and minus of having a single isolated authority with consensus-based decision-making that's driving this. Thanks, um, Diane and Stephen. Um, so we, we've got three more questions and a comment. So I'll read the next two. Um, so the first one is, how were the protected areas in the deep sea mine um, determined or planned? And the second one is, if I understand, this is all based on future batteries having the same composition as those we use today. How much could you expect the material requirement and so the impact in brackets to fall with technological learning? Well, I can talk about the protected areas and Dinah, if you'll do the other one. Um, right now, there uh, are nine uh, protected areas um, uh, designated. And <clears throat> one uh, question that's still being uh, debated is whether they contain um, representative uh, ecological systems uh, that are the same as those that would be um, impacted by mining. The, uh, the It looks like they're pretty good, but are they perfect? Um, don't know. Scientists are involved in um, evaluating that and in uh, discussions with the ISA about, um, about them. Right now, the area designated as protected is uh, 1.4 uh, million square kilometers, and the uh, that's compared to the area uh, that will be ex uh, that would be exploited if it's permitted of uh, 1.2 million square kilometers. Um, in also in the exploited areas, um, there will be places that are uh, either too steep or um, in other ways unsuitable for mining. So those will be left alone. And what's more, contractors are required to. Uh, uh, keep, uh, I think it's 10% of their area um, free from mining uh, for uh, comparative purposes so that it will be available as a control. Um, so there will be a lot of pr uh, protection. It's also true that um, the impacts, particularly of uh, sediment disturbance and um, uh, turbidity uh, sediment settling uh, in places is, is, you know, of concern and has to be uh, watched if sediment settles in, in a place where sediment settles thickly, organisms can be smothered. Um, and um, in the water column, if um, too much uh, sediment is, um, comes out in the discharge water, um, organisms uh, can be harmed, their, uh, either their feeding or their respiration um, apparatus can be clogged and so forth. So um, the plume characteristics in the, in the water column are a subject of very active uh, investigation and the depth of the discharge, whether it is at the bottom or at some intermediate uh, depth, um, is is being um, will be monitored for sure in order to minimize those uh, characteristics. Um, so quickly on to the second one. I believe the question was if the battery the battery comes, comes um, in the coming years, how does that? 
Yeah, okay. especially the, the material requirements. Um, yeah. So I have, sorry, I hear an echo again. Do you hear that or? Yeah. Is that okay now? Okay. Yeah. Um, so this, I, I would say there's two parts to the answer. The first part is um, we, we first found the results by metal. And so regardless of the composition of the metals in the, of the batteries in the future, the individual metal benefits are what they are. So you'll still have a roughly 80% reduction in GWP for looking at uh, for the nickel sulfate, for example. Um, so that those results are, you know, as we as we see what evolves in the actual metal demands, we can just apply those differences in the ratios that we end up seeing to get the aggregate answer, as you would. Um, but secondly, uh, what I my one of my takeaways from Tesla's battery day yesterday is that nickel will continue to be important. And um, if they phase out cobalt, they're doing it by leaning more heavily on nickel. So, and of the batteries of the four metals that we looked at, the nickel had the greatest impact benefit, the 80%. Um, so I would expect qualitatively, the change in battery chemistry is, I expect to give similar qualitative results as we've seen with our specific scenario. It's worth mentioning too, Dinah, that um, if nodules actually become uh, the source um, uh, source that's exploited, the cobalt comes along with the package. You're going to get it anyway. That's true. That's true. It will displace other current sources of cobalt, and that would be good for, for many people. Thank you. Um, we have less than one minute to one thirty, but I'll take the last question and then read the comments as a close. So, um, everyone, uh, please keep bear with us for another two minutes. Um, we'll be done. So, the, the last question is, and then I'll read the comments at the end. Um, it seems that while impacts of land-based mining is mainly derived from LCA, those associated with nodal activities are derived from best practice strict literature. Did you include um, some sensitivity analysis on this impact or tested different land or nodal supply scenarios? Uh, so that's a great point. Um, so two points. One, yes, in fact, in the carbon paper, uh, it's not in the white paper, but it is in the paper that was just published. We do a sensitivity analysis around a few assumptions, both for which production pathways in the landors are included in the baseline and what proportions and around some key assumptions on the nodule side. So I leave you to, to read that as an enticement to read that paper. Um, and secondly, okay. we and we did frame it as it, when you're embarking on a new industry that has the luxury of setting new standards globally, um, we didn't include every optimization that Deep Green is planning. They're actually trying to get a net zero, net carbon zero design. We um, The one key assumption that is in there that we mentioned is the hydropower or renewables power, which any contractor should be able to access. That's the most sensitive assumption, I would say. The rest are um, uh, the offshore processing is in line with the case in a, uh, another, the other LCA available for just the offshore um, for nodules, which is um, it's the energy efficient case, meaning any contractor trying to do an OK job in their energy design would land somewhere around where we did. So it's slightly optimistic, but it also has optimism built into the land ores with the electricity grid changes. All right, thank you. So I'll, I'll read the last comment. Um, framing the issue as a dilemmatic situation in which deep sea mining looks less evil than land mining is problematic. Lesser evil reasoning presents a number of pitfalls and can be misleading, acting as a barrier to a more holistic and systemic approach. Also, when comparing the two, a big concern is how to regulate and control deep sea mining, particularly in international waters. We lack the experience to safely deal with problems several kilometers underwater, experience developed for surface mining over centuries. I think this is a comment for us to think about. Um, perhaps I'll ask each of the speakers to give us like a, a 10 seconds closing message. Um, and then, yes, please. Well, I'll oh, you go first. I can. I'm not sure I got all of the question, but um, in general, I'd say um, everyone has to be careful, whether they're mining on land or in the deep sea, 
and um, it's absolutely urgent to um, do the best that we can to minimize um, the impact on our planetary systems. However, we can do that. That's what has, what to, has be, to be. That's, that's the perspective that I think uh, both Dinah and I take. Um, I will say when it comes to making sure that deep sea mining is well regulated and that good practices are put in place, it, three points. Anytime we do something new, it's scary. And we want the goal is to get as much data as you can before, but there's so pragmatically so much you can. Um, land ore mining comes with, we, we know some good practices. We also are used to their impacts and don't always put them in perspective in comparison to this new option. Um, and third, that the, the community or, that I've seen in giving some of the presentations and collaborations, uh, the community around starting deep sea mining seems very, very hyper-focused on environmental impacts and making sure it's well-managed. So I'm confident that good dialogue is going to be the path to minimize risk. Thank you once again. Um, I must say thanks to our excellent speakers, Diana and um, Stephen, for compressing a 172-page white paper into less than 45 minutes uh, of a great presentation. And thanks to everyone for sharing your lunch hour with us. Thanks to those who have given us four minutes extra of your time. I wish I could ask for another one hour, but I will not be Oliver Twist. Um, thank you so much for your time. And I want to say thanks to Serena uh, for organizing the, the, the seminar and for reminding us, making sure we're on time. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, Stephen, Diana, I hope you have a lovely day. And to everyone who is listening from home, from campus, in the car, do have a lovely afternoon. Uh, take some time to get hydrated. All right, bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bemi. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.